Wendy Booker is a lifelong adventurer, author, speaker, and advocate within the global multiple sclerosis community. Wendy has 16 years of experience in patient advocacy, community engagement, marketing communications, media, events, and public affairs in the biotechnology pharmaceutical sector. Over the years, she has anchored a wide variety of patient relations campaigns, corporate events, community engagement initiatives, training sessions, media campaigns, fundraisers, and public relations functions. Her unique skill set incorporates company mission and philosophies with varied global experiences and challenges while leveraging connections to patient communities, nonprofits, and healthcare industry partners. When were you given your official diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or MS? And um, kind of like, how did it manifest itself uh, and so forth? I was diagnosed in June of 1998. So what, I haven't even done the math anymore. That's 23 years ago, which okay. is, and the, it's very difficult to diagnose MS. It's one of those illnesses where it's done through elimination. I started, uh, I was not a runner, but I laugh because I have a friend who's about half my height and the two of us got kicked out of the gym for talking too much and socializing in gym class. So we started running because we were running out of options. And it was during that running that I noticed my left leg felt funny. And that's the only way I could describe it. Tin, uh, pins and needles, just funny. I ignored it because I thought it's a running injury. Why mm -hmm. I'm still able to run. It must be because it's a new sport, whatever. It became more pronounced and then weird things. I fell for no apparent reason, which mm -hmm. I call the MS fall. And you think you've tripped over a root or a rock or something and you turn around, there's nothing there. Um, right. It's more embarrassing than anything else. Um, often others, now I'm eliminating, I'm jumping already, but that is a hard part because often people with MS are, I have a friend who was picked up in the uh, parking lot of a Target because they thought she was drunk because her gait mm -hmm. was so odd. Anyway, I never connected the dots. I didn't know anything about MS. And over time, that numbness started to creep up the entire side of my left body, stopping at the, at the top of my rib cage. And that's when I knew I had to get medical help. Mm -hmm. All of that was probably in 97. But as I say, it takes a long time to eliminate other things, including Lyme's disease, which is makes you really respect that you should do something when you're outside because mm -hmm. so many illnesses, they start by checking that you get, don't get have lines. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, through that elimination, MRIs, spinal taps, the whole gamut, I was uh, diagnosed in June of 98. Oh, wow. That's and very classic MS. Mm -hmm. I was just a little over 40, which is the MS affects women twice as much as men. And it's usually between the age of 20 and 40. And they also, besides all the tests they can do, you will have had weird neurological events separated by quite a bit of time. And I did. So I really, yeah. truly was a classic MS person. Right. No. Yep. Sure. Um, no, it's, it's a, uh, it's a challenging diagnosis. So once diagnosis. you were um, diagnosed, what treatments or, you know, what modifications did you have to make to your life? Um, you know, I didn't change a thing. And the reason was, and maybe it was ignorance, probably a lot of ignorance. I said to the doctor, the neurologist, well, let's back up because I always want to help people with MS or newly diagnosed know the stage of events. I, of course, started with my general practice doctor. And that's where they actually made the preliminary diagnosis and then sent me to a neurologist, which is what I hope everybody with MS will do. Mm -hmm. And also, you should go to a neurologist who likes to treat MS as a culture, uh, we can be difficult patients, partly because very educated. And nowadays, for all of us, we have WebMD and the computer. So we often come to the doctor's office already smart or knowing more. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the uh, online can be not so good. But anyway, that's where we all go right away. As mm -hmm. soon as you anything, that's mm -hmm. the first place we go to. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I um. I started by going to this neurologist and then I realized that I felt no different the day I found out I had MS than I did about a month before. So I decided to keep on running. Now the doctor, the neurologist was not thrilled. And he said, you know, I'd love it if you found something a little less 
uh, energetic than that. And they were, they were actually saying, why don't you go swim in a pool with a noodle? And I'm like, I don't think I can do that. Oh, yeah. That's not me. Anyhow, I kept pushing. Now, my diagnosis came at like the perfect time, if there is such a thing. At the time of my diagnosis, they had just come out with what's called disease-modifying therapies. There were three that came out, oh, 18 months around the t- before I was diagnosed, right up until about a year before my brand new on the market. And so I was diagnosed in June, and by July, a month later, I was taking a disease-modifying therapy. Wow. That has been a game changer for all of us living with multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. That has totally altered what I call the face of MS. And I t- probably told you earlier, antidotically, I've worked as a motivational speaker for years. When I first started, I would say maybe a little less than a third of the audience were highly disabled, wheelchairs, walkers. And you, because of these therapies, you don't see it as much anymore. And that's where, and now in, we had three in the 90s, now we're up to 17, which is staggering. Wow. But the beauty of that is if you get put on one or, and if it doesn't work or you have side effects or you don't like how you feel or you feel sick, you shouldn't feel like any of those things. Go back to the neurologist and get on a different one. Your options are endless. So anyway, original question, did I do anything differently? No, physically I didn't. I tried to learn everything I could about MS. I am careful of the internet because it can scare the bejesus mm-hmm. out of you. <laughs> and I got a neurologist who likes to treat MS. And I got on one of the therapies and went on living. And that's great. And that's what I feel like everyone should do if they're if they're able to. Yes. Um, which absolutely. fortunately absolutely with any any disease. Let me back up that girl that I was running with, who's a very close friend of mine. At the time of my MS diagnosis, she was diagnosed with breast cancer almost Mm -hmm. to the day. She's doing awesome. So she's now a 23-year survivor. Mm -hmm. She did the exact same thing. And we came to realize it doesn't matter what the diagnosis. It takes your breath away. You become immobilized. We all do. Mm -hmm. And you get to this spot where you don't want to look to the past because now you're mourning what you lost. Mm -hmm. You don't want to look to the future because it's so frightening unpredictable Mm -hmm. that you get stuck in what I call that here and now. And you're, you have to work through that. And her journey was identical, even though the diagnosis was different. So we can say that you too, knowing that when you receive news of an illness that becomes a disability, you will be immobilized for a little while. And then it's up to us to get you on and get you out of that. That's why I love your name, different and able, because it's the able that's the key. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's actually really interesting um, because yesterday I was out with dinner with friends and uh, we we're talking about like cures and treatments and advancements. And I'm just actually kind of relaying it on to like your friend who um, had breast cancer and then obviously your diagnosis. But there are anyways, there are so many um, disorders and conditions of all different types that don't have the same amount of treatment options as MS or breast cancer does. Um, And it's definitely, it's, it's sad. Um, It is sad. There is an organization called, um, I have to think of the NOR, is it NORAD? It's the National Organization of, uh, uh, it's not obscure, it's diseases that do not get a lot of recognition. Uh, um, and there's a, a drug company, I have to look it up, who is working on drugs for these illnesses that you, there are not many people affected by them for rare diseases. Mm-hmm. And that's the key. Even if you get diagnosed with something rare, mm-hmm. you all f- often have to be your own advocate and find out all you can about that illness and how to find people who also have it or to get into a support group or into a doctor who knows how to treat it. Oh, uh, absolutely. And yeah. um, I mean, I was just using that as an example, like I said, MS, breast cancer, um, you know, even, um, you know, epilepsy now there's, I mean, I've had epilepsy, or I guess you can consider I still have it. I've been seizure free for 10 years, but you know, brain injuries, this and that, there's so much advancements, but you know, if, for instance, if you look at, I don't know, I'm just, um, I don't know, I'm just thinking, but whatever, if you look at other disorders, you know, there's not as much. I mean, we were talking about spinal cord injuries um, those last t- night. Those are tough. Yeah. So those yeah. are tough. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. So 
anyways, um, a lot of the people that we interview have some type of silver lining to their difference or believe that there's a silver lining to their difference. Um, do you think you have any silver linings um, to being diagnosed with MS? Absolutely. MS? I agree with everyone else who has said there always is a silver lining. Mm -hmm. Finding it is hard. Recognizing that it's there or that it's that light at the end of the tunnel when you're going through the diagnosis and the fear and all that. But there always is more to the story and more to the diagnosis. And it is a lot of it is your own making. It is what you make of it and mm -hmm. what you do with the diagnosis. In my case, patient advocacy has become my number one mm -hmm. uh, focus so mm -hmm. that I can pass any pearls of wisdom I have on to the next person, especially young girls finding out they have MS. I, it, I you know, we're hearing younger and younger. Um, it doesn't just automatically start at age 18. They even have kids. Now they have pediatric MS centers going as young as babies of 18 months. But it, the, the, the silver lining is that I, I was able to use my voice, use my notoriety that I created to help the next person finding they have MS and to, to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. um, you become more aware, you become more empathetic, um, hopefully a better listener. And so all of that, I have to say, I didn't, don't, don't think I had much of that before my diagnosis. So there is always a silver lining, yes. And that's great. And I think there should always be a silver lining if possible. I do too. Uh, so you are the founder and the CEO of MS Insight. Can you tell us a little bit more about MS Insight and uh, why uh, you created it? Sure. Um, we created it. All of us have MS. And all of us have the same similar that the day you hear you have multiple sclerosis, you're standing in front of that neurologist. I hate to tell you, you have MS your brain kind of stops. At first you go, oh my gosh, I'm going to be one of Jerry Lewis's kids. Well, that's muscular dystrophy. And it's funny how many of us go, did go there. The next thing, and it still is the case, it's very confusing. Where to go? What drug to take? Who to tell? Who not to tell? Do you tell your employer? Do you tell your boyfriend? Whatever it is. And again, people like all of us run to the internet. The amount of information is staggering. It's contradictory. So we decided we wanted to form a nonprofit, a foundation of patients reaching patients through education, through research. Now, because of COVID, we've gone totally online. We will be in person again as soon as we're allowed doing patient programs. And the other thing we do is go and cover the medical conferences. And I laugh because I say we're trying to dumb it down, but I'm serious because it's really interesting, the research going on out there, but I wanna hear it in my terms so that I understand it. Mm -hmm. So we have, we're like teams of reporters. We're, we try to be like The View, where mm -hmm. we sit and hash out topics. And then once these conferences start up again, we take that information and, and get it out to the patients. The uh -huh. patients are an integral part because as I say, we're patients reaching patients and it's become such a joy. It's so much fun to do. And we have a, a very large Facebook following as well as a support group, which the support group blows my mind because the patients are really reaching each other, just what we wanted, giving advice, telling people where to find a good doctor. Um, we try to be totally obtainable. They can email us, they can talk to us. So that's my MS insight. That is truly my silver lining because that's taking wow. everything I've done for the past 23 years and now giving back to the patient to try to make that journey from diagnosis on a little easier. It's amazing. I look yeah. forward to seeing the work. It's a great thing that you um, created. I don't think a lot it's of people. about a year and a half old. So we're still. Okay. You're still young, kind of like me. We're very I mean. young. We're coming along. Um, we follow in the steps. We had a, a founder who worked for MS World. His name was Alan Mandel. And he started a thing called um, MS Talks. And it was kind of like a TED Talk. And we would film them and then get that information out. And Alan passed away uh, a year ago, November. And so, so about a year and a half ago now. And so we are honoring Alan and we are picking up that series in his name and his legacy and his family is also very involved with us. So it's an honor to do Alan's work as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really, really special. Yeah, for sure. So you have three sons, Christopher, uh, Christopher, Jeff and Alex. Yeah. Um, 
if they were sitting here, I wish I could have one of your sons be my brother. Oh, they're really I, good. They're your age too. I, I'm 32. I, I, I have a feeling that they're my Alex age. Is, Alex is your age. My youngest oh, wow. just turned 32. Actually, close to your birthday. He's an April baby. Oh, wow. So yeah. fun. Um, anyways, um, what would they say, uh, you know, your purpose is in life and how um, have they, if they were sitting right next to you, um, how have they, I guess, seen you grow despite your, I mean, given your MS in new ways? Um, I don't, I mean, obviously, I don't know the specific time that's frames a, from that's a when they were born question. and you had MS, but or before MS, but. Originally, initially, well, Alex was, I think, like eight when I was diagnosed, he, or oh. 10. He was young. Oh. And uh, we didn't, we kind of none of us knew how to handle it. You know, as a family, it's dumped on you. And, and they too probably were nervous. Um, they've become very sensitive. Like they'll know to hand me an arm if it's on rough ground, you know, for walking. And they've really become tuned in to that. Sometimes I can have trouble or, but then I started doing all this cool stuff. And at first they didn't talk about it. And people always ask me, what do your kids think? I thought they don't say much. What's funny is if I was picking a kid up and all their friends got in the car, they'd be like, oh, you're the mom who's climbing all the mountains. So I knew they were talking about me to their friends. Wow. I, I know that um, it was a frightening time in the beginning, mm -hmm. but now they're my number one fans. If I set out to do a project or do some crazy adventure, my oldest in particular, now all three of them, they'll have looked up every minutia and was I aware of this? Was I aware of that? Am I going here? Am I going to do that? So they've behind the sun, they've become my team. Even That's though they're awesome. now all grown and about to get married and have families and such, they're really good about checking in. They're really good about saying, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And so I'm very blessed to have them. And they did see us. We all evolved with MS together. Yeah, absolutely. Did they live I, in the area near you and your husband or are they? No, all... they're scattered. They're okay. one in DC, one in New York and one in Colorado. Okay. Uh, we have a family reunion every summer. So we all, and then the youngest is getting married in September. That's so we'll awesome. all be together. Um, it was, like I said, uh, finding out your mom has MS. I'm sure that they were frightened. I'm sure that they, like me, went on the internet and said, uh oh, this isn't good. Right. But they too have grown and realized they probably would say that I won't let them have an excuse for not taking something on. So there's probably that side too. Right. No, so, of course. And the lessons learned. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing that they're your biggest fans as if, I mean, all children and, and, you know, spouses or, you know, so forth should be your biggest fans. Um, but you know, it, it, you know, not everyone is as, you know, dedicated, like for instance, as me or as uh, your, your three boys are. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's really nice to hear. Um, so you have a very athletic lifestyle um, by climbing mountains, running, doing marathons, um, trekking to remote places and more. Have you, oh, and I guess maybe a little bit of this we've touched on, but have you had to cut back on the frequency or the intensity of um, doing all these different um, sports? No, or I, I'm getting older. Right. So well, yeah. <laughs> the age is all of a sudden, it's funny because I now live in the mountains up in New Hampshire. I do still climb a lot. Oh, you do? Um, okay. <laughs> I'm still climbing. They're not as big as Everest or Denali, but- I always say a mountain is a mountain and will always offer you more than you started with. You always come away learning something and it's always a challenge. It can be a 2000 foot mountain or a 29,000 foot mm -hmm. mountain. You're going to have to dig in and, and suck it up and do it. Mm -hmm. um, I still do that. I still run. I take a, took up a new sport a year ago, which is something I encourage people with MS to look for things that you can do and can have fun doing and can feel successful at. I started rowing crew, which is brand new for me. That's those skinny little boats. And mm -hmm. now, unfortunately with COVID, I haven't been able to get on a boat except by myself because we can't row in quads or eights. Right. I'll be doing that this summer, but I'm very dedicated rower. And in June, I'm going to summer camp to a rowing camp, which is gonna be an overnight, like I'll probably be the oldest one there. And it's a brand new challenge and captivating. I got an indoor erg or rowing machine and I really enjoy it. It can be a very 
uh, difficult. It's a difficult sport. It's like a ballet once you're out on the water. Right. But it's it's a joy to start something new and and get my body doing something I hadn't done before. So that's another thing I encourage people with any kind of disability. It's hard. COVID made it harder. Or the motivation slipped and the being in our sweatpants or pajamas all day. I mean, it's like, who wants to get sweaty? So I too am coming out of that. What do they call it? Languishing is what the New York Times called it. I'm coming out of my languishing and I'm getting back to work. The way I want to encourage people with disabilities is you will feel so much better if you keep moving in some way. Yoga for people with MS is amazing. They can do it from their wheelchair. One of the girls that is on MS Insight with me is, is, has primary progressive MS, which we'll talk about in a minute. And she's wheelchair bound because she broke her ankle severely. Mm -hmm. She's now celebrating that she can take 20 to 40 steps a day, which is awesome. She's digging in. She's trying. She's working. It's a lot of work. She goes to physical therapy three times a week, comes home exhausted. But she says it's such a, a high to be able to do that. And that's what people will get from finding something that they can try and exercise on. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's really, really incredible. Um, so in your interviews, you've joked about MS saying, um, this ain't your mama's MS. Um, do you often use humor when you're speaking to yes. um, audiences? Yes. And what does humor bring out um, when talking about MS to you or to, and to even to convey to your audiences? It can also convey a, in a lovely way a message. When I say this ain't your mama's MS, I truly mean that those therapies Our mothers didn't have those therapies. Mm -hmm. Prior to 1993, if you were diagnosed with MS, it was a pretty devastating diagnosis. Mm -hmm. They had nothing. They told you to go home and prepare for a wheelchair. That's all they could tell you. You might go on steroids if you had a flare up, which is just for anti-inflammatory and steroids themselves have some pretty severe side effects. That's Mm -hmm. all they had. Now, as I said earlier, in the 90s, we had three therapies. Now we have 17, including therapies that are now for people who are primary progressive. MS has two forms. I guess that's the best way to say it. I have what's called relapsing remitting, which means it comes and goes. And 85% of the MS population is diagnosed with relapsing remitting. 15% on PON diagnosis uh, never go into a remission. They constantly are heading downhill, which is a really difficult diagnosis. And then of that 85% of relapsing remitting, people then develop where they never go into remission. And that's called second, uh, how do they call it? Secondary, they keep changing the name, secondary progressive. Mm -hmm. So these therapies are key because they will keep you longer in remission and reduce the relapse rate. And that's what we're looking for. Oh, wow. So that's what I mean when I say the St. Your Mom is MS, because it truly has changed dramatically in these 23 years. Mm-hmm. But humor is a gentle way of getting a message across. It's also, to me, helps with a very serious topic that can be devastating. Now, I don't want to make light of it by laughing at it, but that's where that silver lining comes in. That's where that joy uh, of watching somebody like my friend Shirley take 20 steps Mm-hmm. And we'll tease her, we'll laugh with her, we'll applaud her, and we'll celebrate her. And all of that takes a lighter lightness of heart. I also think humor and a, a lighter heart is easier on the psyche because depression is a big part of MS, very big part, as it is with a lot of chronic illnesses. So if you can find that lightness a little bit, it can help. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it, it can be this everyday gloom. So if, if you can try to at least find that silver lining and laugh, it's a little easier to take. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think humor is, um, you know, very, very important. I, uh, as nothing, it's has nothing to do with my brain injury being necessarily a res- being a result of it, but I do depression and anxiety do run in my family. Yeah. Um, anxiety is more based around my, uh, about having seizures and, you know, cause I know, I, I know the onset of, but anyways, I've been seizure free for 10 years. So it's like a whole other thing. Yeah. Awesome. But I do suffer from depression. Um, and, uh, you know, my whole point is, is that humor can just be such a, like, you know, uh, a way out, you know, I mean, laughing and just getting your, you know, endorphins running and yeah. So, yeah. 
Um, so if you could tell the doctors or neurologists something, um, what would, what, what would it be as a patient who has MS? Cause they're not living in your shoes. They just know about it. Yeah. It would be first of all, to help that newly diagnosed, get through the confusion. It, it, it is so confusing. There's so many organizations. I first looked up the MS Society right after I was diagnosed and it was still in the newspaper. It wasn't on online. It probably was yet, but I didn't, it wasn't as computer savvy. And I remember thinking, oh God, this disease must be really bad. There's a whole society. <laughs> yeah, like, wow, it's gotta be bad. They wouldn't have that. Those things are confusing to hear. Um, a neurologist, the best ones are sensitive, but also optimistic that are, and they need to be dead honest, as honest as they can working with it, such an unpredictable illness. But that is what the patient wants. They don't want to be lied to or, or, or told something different. Give them the facts, help them make the decision on which drug to take. That's also hard because mm -hmm. there are so many. I expect my neurologist to guide me in my drug choice of, the, of these therapies. A patient doesn't know to ask what the side effects are. They're just hoping that it's going to keep them walking. So the doctor, I leave it up to the doctor to say, okay, this drug has these side effects, but it's such a low rate of them. Let's try it. You can always switch. So it's that education component. That's what I really want from the neurologist. Yes, they see the disease all day and they probably aren't as, as they become kind of callous, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but be honest with that patient. Mm -hmm. Help them get the choice of the drug that's going to work best for them. Uh, listen to them. Uh, that's the other thing with MS because it is difficult to diagnose. And so often patients will complain and the doctor brushes them aside. So the doctor needs to just be aware and really listen. And boy, I know some great neurologists. Mm -hmm. To the MS patient, I want to add, if you are close and live near an MS center, which more and more are popping up, go to the MS center. Go to a doctor who just sees MS. You know, neurologists, you go to one for your seizure, for epilepsy, um, which is wonderful, but don't go to a general neurologist. Go to an MS specialist. Mm -hmm. And so the MS centers, you can look them up or you can call the National MS Society and they will tell you if there's a center near you. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would try to tell patients, doesn't matter if you're in Louisiana or in Missouri, get yourself to an MS center and go where that's all they see. And that whole center is set up for the patient. Occupational therapy, physical therapy, the doctor, everything is there. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of the worry and the guessing from the patient out. Yeah. And the doctors are getting, the ones who are at the centers are really the best MS doctors out there. Absolutely. No, I think it's really important um, to go to a doctor that specializes in X, Y, and Z. I mean, you can yeah. go to so many different neurologists and you know whatever they can take an MRI and like read it but they don't know the ins and outs and no. they wouldn't go see a general neurologist for my epilepsy I mean I see um actually I see Orrin um Davinsky I don't know if you've seen his name and I recognize that name that's why I'm bringing. he's he very in, well known Orrin Davinsky where's he I know he's in Manhattan is he at um Mount Sinai He's at NYU. He right. um, runs um, FACES, which is Finding a Cure for Epilepsy and Seizures. He's been all over the news, developing cannabis and so yeah. newspapers. Anyways, just, you know, I brought up his name. He's, he's lovely, um, has an amazing bedside manner. And, and also, you can say the same thing. As a patient, doesn't it make you feel better mm -hmm. that you are at that, have that doctor? Because you have confidence in them. And oh, absolutely. when he tells you and guides you, mm -hmm. it's like trusting your parent. You feel really good that I'm doing the best I can because I have the best man helping me there or woman. Oh, yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, it's funny because I actually and it's just because they have a home in the Hamptons. It's literally down the street from us. Actually, I do know his family and his wife and I speak all the time. He has two girls. It's lovely. But it's such a reassuring like feeling and like, it's even like, Oh, I know that like at the drop of a hat, I can call him and yeah. you know, he'll be there. Yeah. And like, it's funny because sometimes my mom will say, well, you, cause I look up to him so much and I take his advice so seriously that I'm kind of like, I don't know what I would do without him. I have to ask him like, about <laughs> <laughs> cause my seizures do. And even though I'm seizure free, the worry, no, that, yeah, it all, 
it, well, it's, it's, it's also it's, hard to live as if the other shoe is going to drop. You know right. what I mean? Exactly. And we play with that in our head. You will say, I've been seizure free for 10 years. Am I going to have another seizure anytime now? Oh, yes, of course. I have the same thing with MS. I've been relapse free a long time. Maybe I'm due for one. And that's where that neurologist, and as you said, what would I tell a neurologist? That's what I would say. Please be sensitive with that fear. Please be sensitive with our questions and be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like statistics too. If they would say, hey, you haven't had a seizure for 10 years, therefore you're probably not going to have another one for a while because you've done so well, I'm, then I can handle that. Same right. with the doctor. If he says, wow, you haven't had a relapse for five years, that's really a good sign. Yeah. Then you feel like, okay, now I can go on. Right. Not like you're waiting for it to happen. You feel, so I, that's what I mean. The doctors need to be honest with us yeah, and yeah. then go from there. Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, anyways, we have one more question. Um, you and I can chit chat until four. I know that's what we said. We could talk all day. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Um, what has been the, one of the, um, biggest life lessons that you've learned so far in your life? Oh, the really biggest is it's not about the ego. Mm. And when you start doing the things I was doing and becoming the first person to summit all these mountains and, I was humbled when I was unable to summit Everest. And that's where all of a sudden I realized it wasn't about me. It can't be about me. That's not fair. MS gave me the, the, the kick in the butt to go out and do these things. But it was never, it should never, and I hope was never about me, but about my mission. Mm -hmm. And my mission was to educate, motivate, and challenge those living with MS. Mm -hmm. And to say, you all have a mountain, your mountain is multiple sclerosis, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. And I had to learn that, though. In the beginning, I became very self-involved with my mission. And I had to do it. I had to get it done. I had to be successful. And once I didn't summit Everest, because of MS is what took that summit away, I had to be, I was humiliated, and I had to be humbled. And that's when I said, this is not about you, it's about the multiple sclerosis. And that was the biggest life lesson I learned. Mm -hmm. It can't be about the ego because the minute the ego gets involved, you're going to have problems. Right. Absolutely. And so it, that really is, I've never said that before. That's also a great question. But if I, I thought of all of these things I could tell you that were minimal compared to it can't be about the ego. Wow. Yeah. So there you go. That's the most honest I've ever been too. <laughs> there you go. Oh, it probably yeah. brings little tears into your eyes. Well, you can share this once it's live and you can spread it to the entire world. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's amazing. This has been so much fun. You're amazing. I've really been lucky. I feel there's that silver lining again. I've been blessed. I have a big mouth. I have a mission. And uh, I, in, in the climbing world, when you're climbing the technical and you're on the ropes and you have the, the, all the equipment and the crampons and all the gear, when you're starting to climb, they usually, you can't see the people that you're climbing with. They're too far away, at least 20 feet. So you, first thing you say is when you're ready to go, all systems are go, you say climbing. And that person who's got you holding you on belay, it's called, says climb on. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like to tell the MS patient. Climb on, come climb with me. We can do this together. So there it is. That's my whole mission right there. Yeah. So interesting that you that you climb. I mean, it's amazing. Like I'm the most fearful person. Like I could never climb. I mean, maybe after X number of years of like learning and like um, you know, whatever, building up my stamina. But that's that's incredible. Like, you know, it's funny now. People go, Oh, what are you climbing? And I'm like, nothing. I'm kind of happy now. <laughs> <gasps> oh, are you going to go do Everest again? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, it's, I mean, you can do it. You can do other things now. Yes. I'm so it's, but it is funny because I too am a fearful person. And there are times when I go, how did I ever get into that? Yeah. And as I said, the older I get, the more I'm like, I must've been nuts. <laughs> you climb, I know you said you climbed with like a friend, but like, do you climb, whether it be with your husband or your family or, you know, like, obviously, not necessarily on your missions, you know, in the past, but you know, do you now always I climb my husband and then I have two girlfriends that I've run many, many marathons with who are taking up climbing, especially during COVID because no run races. And they came up last fall and we started climbing a ton. Uh -huh. um, doing it with buddies is always much more fun. Right. 
And um, here in New Hampshire, there's 48 mountains over 4,000 feet. Maybe I'll do them. I've done a bunch already. But it, being outside in nature, being goofing around with a bunch of friends is awesome. Yeah. And it is COVID. It's COVID safe. So it's really become. Right. Yeah. Being outside. So how long does it take you to um, climb a mountain? Well, obviously it all depends. One's near Uh, your house. Funny thing is I'm really good at going up. I can just plow up there coming down. I'm terrible. I was terrible on the big peaks too. The more efficient climbers do very well, either up or down. I've always struggled down. And and I, when I was learning, I went down backwards because I was felt more secure with my butt out. It was not the best technique. I'm still that way. I noticed, but you know, I don't know. Let's choose a 4,000 foot mountain. You're probably going to be four hours up and two hours down, something like that. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, smaller like ones, here, there's tons of little ones here that we can, you can get up in 40 minutes and you can be done in an hour. Right. So you just pick and choose. Right. Yeah. So like on the six hour ones, like you bring up your lunch or your or whatever. Yep. And, okay. Yeah. And no. the dog, the dog can go with you on the, there's an app called all trails. Okay. And I would, anybody who wants to get into the outdoors, it tells the trails how hard they are, how long it's going to take, if it's dog friendly, optional trails that it'll tell you if you want a harder one, go left. If you want the easier one, go right. So you can educate yourself. Also backing up with our MS Insight, we have a new member called, her name is Beth Erickson, and she's a college professor in Sacramento. And she does- Familiar. She does outdoor recreation. Is her she's got a PhD in forestry, and we're going to interview her because she's going to tell us how you find out which national parks are friendly for people with disabilities. How you get in them? Do you have to do something different if you're in a wheelchair to visit, say, the Grand Canyon? Mm-hmm. So all of that is now available that wasn't available even 20 years ago. So I I encourage people to find out what's going on right outside their front door and what's going on nationally. And just because they have a disability shouldn't stop them from enjoying it. Not at all. Yeah. So there you go. Yep. Amen to that. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Absolutely. This is my pleasure. I'm so glad we connected and we were able to do this.